opportunities for local government action. This session is being organized by the European Covenant of Mayors Coalition of the Willing on Sustainable Buildings and Neighborhoods and uh, is being also co organized in collaboration with the EU funded project Excess. Um, my name is Andreas Jaeger and I have the honor of functioning as uh, your host and moderator today. Um, I'm also the co coordinator of the aforementioned coalition at the European Covenant. So the importance of neighborhood approaches to enable sustainability transformations at subnational level is being increasingly recognized across all levels of government. And over the coming years, we will witness significant changes to our built environment um, as citizens, local governments, and other stakeholders implement ambitious climate and energy actions in the districts in which we live, uh, in which we work, and in which we play. So today's session is therefore a timely moment to explore how integrated urban actions are initiated to improve energy efficiency, enhance energy flexibility, and increase renewable energy generation at district level. As is evidenced by today's level of attendance, uh, there is a high level of interest in this topic, and I really encourage all of you to um, engage with our speakers that are um, taking part today and uh, ask questions by using the chat function in the uh, online meeting platform. And if time allows, I will directly field those questions after individual presentation segments, or I will move them towards the end of the session after the panel discussion. So um, on a final technical point, I would just like to note that this session is being recorded and I hope that that is all right with everyone. So let us now dive into what we can expect uh, of today's session. And uh, it is a real privilege for me to introduce the agenda as well as today's really fantastic speakers. So just to begin with, we start with a block of um, two framing presentations to explore the feasibility and concepts underpinning positive energy buildings and districts. Firstly, we go into some of the real life challenges and opportunities regarding energy positive buildings in Europe. And this presentation will touch upon stakeholder needs, challenges faced, and implications for the wider rollout of positive energy buildings and districts. We then move to another presentation, and uh, here the focus will move from the building level to the integrated cross-sectoral neighborhood level. And there we will be exploring some of the concepts and frameworks that support cities in this process. Coming from this kind of framework level, we then dive into city level examples. So this will be a really exciting moment to explore how the cities are experiencing and, and, and planning their um, transformation of neighborhoods. Um, firstly, we will hear from the city of Limerick in Ireland, uh, where integrated district actions have been rolled out. Um, amongst others, the presentation will delve into energy considerations, the legislative background that underpins the great work of the local government, and uh, also feature, of course, um, the European funded project um, that, that is uh, being facilitated there. Following this presentation from the city of Limerick, we then uh, dive into, um, pardon me, oops, we had a slight mix up. <laughs> uh, we then dive into a, a, a case study from the city of Ulu in Finland. And here we will be looking more at the technical uh, implementation, the solutions that the city has come up with to implement at the district level and uh, looking also at the regional dimension of their en energy planning approach. We then move from these, this uh, presentation segment to a panel discussion where all our speakers are, will be joining us. And here we will be um, reflecting on topics such as boundary issues, um, 
as well as the role of stakeholder engagement, technical challenges and solutions, policy frameworks to catalyze actions, and I hope we have time for it and uh, that we then really also engage with the audience and, and field some of your questions. Um, I will try to sprinkle them in whenever they come, um, but it'll be great to, to hear your, your thoughts and questions to, to bring these to the attention of our speakers. Right, without further ado, I think it's time that we get started. And uh, with that, I would like to extend a very, very warm welcome to Andreas Türk, who is a project coordinator of uh, an EU funded project called Excess. He is also a senior researcher at the Institute for Climate, Energy <coughs> and Society at UNEOM Research. And he also leads a subtask on economic questions in the context of the International Energy Agency's Energy in Buildings and Communities program. So, Andreas, the floor is your, yours, and it is fantastic to have you with us. Good morning to everybody. My name is Andreas Turk. Be behind uh, me, you can see our office building. It's a plus energy tower with a, lo with a lot of PV and a big heat pump in the ground. Um, second. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to present you the project Excess to um, share with you some insights from our demos, but also to share with you the ongoing discussion we have in our project. Excess uh, is a four years project started in 2019, um, goes until 2023. We have 70 partners from um, 10 countries. We have four demos in four climate zones. One demo in Belgium, Spain, fin Finland and Austria. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm working at UNEO Research, it's a big, Austrian research company. And the institute I'm affiliated with is called LIFE, Institute for Climate, Energy, and Society. In, it's, a, it's a visible institute um, with a clear social mission, transition to a low carbon economy society with a sustainable energy system, development of business models for decentralized energy systems as well as buildings, we're very strong in the environmental and social economic impact assessments. And our headquarters is, is in Graz. But of course, we have offices in Klagenfurt and Vienna. Um, when we submitted Excess, what were the topics that um, motivated us um, three years ago to submit this project and win it? Uh, three years ago, the clean energy package was a hot policy topic. The idea was that the clean energy package, such as the concept of energy communities or the possibility to provide uh, residential flexibilities on markets will lead to new, re new revenue streams for plus energy buildings that ca can make uh, um, a viable business case. In the meantime, we also have the renovation wave that asks for smart renovations with technology upgrades and flexibilization of buildings. But we also saw that we need new technologies for plus energy buildings, um, different technologies for different climate zones and aligning the stakeholders that are relevant to plus energy buildings or plus energy districts seemed to us um, as a key uh, factor to roll out the concept. Um, a quick uh, zooming into the excess demos. Um, one demo is in Finland, and the big innovation there is uh, deep boreholes, three times 800 meters. The heat uh, source party PVT panels, and we will use um, the heat from the PVT panels also to heat up the undergrounds. So PVT heat surplus will be used to charge the ground during the transitional months. Um, another important aim is to improve the efficiency of heat pumps. We, we need um, high efficiency, high COP heat pumps for dis district heating water. 
And why is it innovative? Why is it um, maybe a game changer for cities in Northern European countries? You don't need so many, uh, um, you don't need so many small boreholes, but can um, have centralized uh, large ones. This is important for the densely density built environments. In Spain, um, our demo is located in Nivales. It's a big plant solar city near Granada. And here we focus rather on integrating existing technologies such as PV, uh, geothermal heat pumps, uh, battery storage, uh, electric vehicles. So the integration of existing technologies um, is the key element here. And it, it sounds simplistic, but as soon as you have two, three different technologies, you need complex control systems. You need to deal with technical barriers like interoperability. So um, it's more complex than it looks at the first glance. But we also have a demo in Austria, in Graz, in our city. And here the key um, uh, innovation is a multifunctional facade that um, can be used for PV, for heating, for cooling, with a couple of other technologies like heat pumps, community battery, um, electric cars. But our uh, idea is that um, a new multifunctional facade that insulates, but also um, generates uh, electricity heat uh, has a high replication potential within the renovation market. In Bel Belgium, we install 110 PVT panels on a social housing complex and use the heat for a multi-sourced uh, uh, heat pump. We also have seasonal borehole storage. Uh, the, heat, the PVT heat circuits will be used to charge the grounds. And we have power to heat flexible thermal storages. We make the boilers in this housing complex flexible, generate flexibility. It's, a, it's like a smart retrofit. And we think that smart retrofits are very important also in the context of um, the renovation wave. So we think there's a high replication potential in existing um, buildings. This is the hypothesis of the demos, but realities in uh, uh, demo projects are always very different. And of course, we face a range of barriers, issues. Um, I want to share some of the um, insights with you that we faced so far. Of course, legal and regulatory barriers. In most of the demos, we have very long permitting processes. Modifying the use of existing buildings is very challenging because it affects the neighboring areas. It can lead uh, uh, to the fact that maybe neighboring companies have um, stricter noise um, standards. The building regulations in some countries are fragmented. For example, Austria has nine, nine, Austria is small, but still we have nine provinces and every province has different building regulations. Um, refurbishment measures on existing buildings are also restricted due to fire protection and monument protection. In our Finnish demo, we wanted to um, install, test solar balconies. Uh, balconies equipped with PVT, but it was not allowed due to um, fire protection rules in Finland. In Austria, we plan to have the multifunctional facade made of wood, but um, in, in the city of Graz, Buildings that have more than 10 floors cannot have, have wood facades, also due to fire protection. So a multitude of restrictions that uh, we faced. All of the demos are aimed to become um, energy communities, but um, the energy community concepts are not yet really operational. Many countries have, um, in principle, reg regulatory frameworks in place but they are sometimes very restrictive. And in practice, um, it will still need uh, time to, to keep this, uh, to, uh, to realize this concept. We're not yet there. Technological barriers, the integration of new technologies into existing buildings is challenging. 
not all areas are suitable for the integration of um, energy technology elements. What we also saw, uh, we need to think about installation. In our Belgium demo, as I mentioned earlier, the plan is to install 110 PVT panels on a flat roof. But we didn't find uh, any Belgium installer that is able to install PVT uh, at a reasonable price because you need to, uh, to have uh, skills in um, electric installations, but also hydraulic um, um, circuit, circuits. And this um, uh, combination of, of skills is obviously missing in some countries. Also, we see that uh, we didn't find anybody to install the multifunctional facade in Austria at a reasonable price. So the, the demo owner is doing it um, himself. So it, it's also a lack of, um, of technical skills among um, existing companies. As I mentioned earlier, the interplay of technologies, as soon as you have two, three technologies, um, you, you may have interoperability problems. It becomes very complex. You need um, new ICT solutions for control, for managing it. And we, co we conclude that there's a need for technology integrators that are able to install these this, uh, rather complex solutions. And this could be service providers that are specialized in buildings. Another important topic we discussed in the site is design and urban planning. Um, having pe PEPs and PETs in city planning is uh, very important. It's the most important instrument for energy efficient urban planning, but many cities don't know how to include plus energy buildings or plus energy districts in their city planning. Um, there's not even a consolidated definition of plus energy buildings and districts. There's also a huge uh, lack of know-how among architects and planners. Uh, many uh, plus energy buildings are just awful. They don't look nice. And this and aesthetics are very important. Design components have significant impact on the acceptance of new technologies. So we need well-planned integration in the roof and facade. We need aesthetic effects, not only because of shape and color, but also uh, via structure, size, proportion, and surface of the appearance. And the architects and the planners are those that decide they need to understand this and they need to integrate it into their uh, routines. Um, These were some insights from the access demos and from stakeholder interviews, workshops with uh, a large range of actors we had in, in the last two years. But um, in my introduction uh, slide, why we submit so why we submitted access, I mentioned the clean energy package. But in the meantime, the, dis uh, the discussion has shifted. Um, if we speak with, with stakeholders, policymakers, the interaction of plus energy buildings and districts with surrounding energy systems is becoming highly important. For the grid operators, plus energy districts are still aliens. They are, they are problematic. If they feed in a lot in summer and um, buy back in, in winter, they use the grid, grid as storage. And we need to find solutions that avoid stressing the grids and creating high flexibility potential for users and uh, the service side. Um, the, the discussion uh, uh, moves towards defining plus energy buildings and districts, not only as um, entities that provide a surplus of energy, but uh, also flexibility, becoming active elements in the energy system that are integrated and create um, a win-win situ situation also for, for the uh, broader energy, energy systems. We also saw in discussions with the city that the city uh, expects pets to be, to be more than um, delivering uh, plus energy. They want to understand how the infrastructure can be shared. What is the benefit of pets for cities for the wider infrastructure? And this can also improve the, the business case for plus energy buildings. 
Also, we need to uh, have a broader vision on value chains. We uh, need to not only to speak with developers, but also with energy suppliers and other um, broader stakeholders. Another shift of discussion relates to the green deals. The green deal um, is, go, is going far beyond energy and CO2 emissions. Um, new strategies, regulation, focus on energy efficiency, yes, but also on water, circular economy, biodiversity, energy poverty. Um, there's a lack currently on integrating circularity principles into pet concepts. We need to include, consider also embodied emissions, new materials, low carbon materials. But again, as I mentioned for the um, case of Graz, we wanted um, a wooden facade, it was just not possible. So all these new ideas, these new um, requirements um, may also conflict with, again with regulation, with restrictions we face in existing um, built environments. Overall, we concluded that PEP concepts have to be updated for the Green Deal. I have a last slide with a couple of conclusions. We need simple solutions to start, like um, uh, a multifunctional facade or retrofit of boilers to make them flexible. Um, we need to find ways that uh, plus energy buildings and districts become active elements in, in an energy system and perfectly interact with the surrounding um, system. But also we need to guide cities where and how to start um, and how to align plus energy districts with other city strategies, such as mobility plans. We made the experience that um, um, city planners and policymakers from cities just um, don't know exactly how, how to deal with the concept of PEPs and PETs, how to start. We need to align PET stakeholders and uh, create cross-sectoral and circular value chains with win-win situation, uh, win -win situations for all stakeholders involved. This was my little intro for this uh, workshop. Fantastic, Andreas. Thank you so much. And uh, I think it is uh, really, really interesting to, to explore the building level and already see the, the issues with complexity um, that then only become magnified to an even greater scale when we move to the district level. Yeah. It is also nice to have a bit of hope there as well that that local governments have some leverage and that you know the the ch some of the challenges with building codes at different levels of government could could actually be shifted to to enable positive energy buildings and districts more readily um, so thank you so much for that. Um, in, in the interest of time, I will move on uh, from, from this really great framing presentation, um, which really segues very nicely into uh, our next presentation, um, which is um, going to look at some of the concepts and frameworks that underpin the positive energy districts. And for that, I would really like to invite um, Vicky Albert Seifer, Seifried to the stage. Um, she is a senior researcher at the Fraunhof Institute for Solar Energy Systems uh, in Freiburg in Germany. She is also a chair of the Cost Action Positive Energy District European Network. And further, she is engaged in the International Energy Agency's Energy in Buildings and Communities Program and the energy, uh, the European Energy Research Alliance joint program Smart Cities. So with that introduction, I would like to welcome and give the floor to Vicky. Over to you, Vicky. So oh, thank you, Andy. Um, well, I will just now start to share my screen. Can you hear my screen? Yeah. Yes, we can. Sure. Great, yeah. So, yeah, so thanks for the introduction, Andy. Um, as she said, um, I'm Vicky Albers-Weifried and I'm a senior researcher in the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy System in Germany. Um, I have several hats, actually. Um, he already mentioned that I'm involved in several different initiatives working um, specifically um, on the topic of pets. 
And so in my presentation, um, it is based on my work um, in these different um, initiatives. So I'm quite active in this area. Well, so um, we are going to um, talk about positive energy districts in this presentation, but I think first we want to know what do we mean by positive energy districts. Um, the concept of positive energy districts are not completely new. It's actually um, built on already um, some existing um, concepts that were developed previously. The most relevant one would be the net zero energy district and the positive energy block. And the concept of positive energy district was introduced, I think, um, formally in the EU and strategic energy technology plan, so-called the SET plan, Action 3.2, Smart Cities and Community. And in the SAT plan, um, positive energy district is described as a district with annual net zero energy import and net zero CO2 emissions, working towards an annual local surface production of renewable um, energy. And PETs are expected to be implemented in new build, retrofitted, or a mixed district. They should be driven by renewable energy and be an integral part of the urban and regional energy system. And they should be based on high energy efficiency and make optimal use of technology to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. Besides the energy aspect, PEP should offer affordable living for inhabitants. And in the second, um, there is a vision to create 100 positive energy districts, like what we described here in Europe by 2025. So it's a very ambitious um, goal. Well, so PET, since then, um, PET are recognized as really one of the central pillars for driving urban energy trans transition, especially in Europe. Um, since the implementation of the Saturn um, Action 3.2, there has been a growing number of PET-oriented projects and initiatives. That is a really great thing. However, that is one, um, kind of a challenge. That is, um, if you recall the description in the Zeppelin um, Action 3.2, you can remember that the description is relatively general. And that means it is really open for interpretation. So in the end, the result is that different projects actually interpret it quite differently. And also they set different baselines and which makes it really difficult to evaluate um, the outcome of the, those pet projects and also to compare between different projects. So to see this, um, the lack of um, this um, common pet definition and the problem, the JPI Urban Europe actually now is leading an, uh, an initiative or um, a group for um, developing a common European pet definition together. And the aim of this exercise is to try to create a set of really consistent core requirements for PET, and also a framework to integrate PET into the national energy system and to support their implementation at the local, regional, and national, as well as the EU level. So this is a very important um, development at the PET um, field at the moment. Um, in the September last year, um, JPI Urban Europe um, published a draft proposal for this um, common European path definition. And this proposal has been circulated and also um, to um, many um, relevant stakeholders. And there were several workshops organized um, to try to collect feedback from the different um, people on this proposal. So um, at the moment, this proposal is now under review. And the, um, the plan is that um, there will be a consolidated draft of the, of the common European path definition, hopefully in the first quarter of this year. And then afterwards, there will be national consultation of the definitions. And eventually, hopefully, there will be then a final fixed common European path definition um, in around summer or um, before this year. So this is a very, very important um, exercise that we are doing. And while um, I am from the different um, initiative trying to support um, this exercise, 
we um, identified that there are um, several challenges actually to create such um, a common definition. So um, the first challenge is that um, we can see that um, the concept of pets actually go beyond the positive energy and towards ne climate neutrality. And so when we talk about pets, we talk about positive energy balance, but this is not the sole objective and this should not be. And um, we should think about pets as um, a stepping stone towards climate neutrality. And this is also consistent to the um, climate neutral um, ambitions of the EU. And the second um, challenge we can see is that um, the pet definition should go beyond um, quant qualitative description, but towards more quantitative definition. Um, so what we mean is that we would like to see, or we need actually really a set of methods for um, calculating, assessing pets based on the energy balance, based on the amount of renewable energy and um, generation and so on. So that should be a very simple method that can help um, developers, can help all the people involved in the pet development to evaluate whether um, their project on is the pet or not. And then the third challenges we can see is that pet, the scope of pets should go beyond energy. So we talk a lot about um, positive energy, but we should also don't forget that um, pets should fulfill a lot of other qualitative criteria, such as the social, economic, and environmental sustainability um, criteria as well, because the pets should provide not just um, um, a high um, energy efficient district, but also an affordable um, and an enjoyable living environment for them to participants uh, for the citizens. And then finally, um, we can see that when we look at um, one single um, common path definition, this definition needs to be applied to many different districts and cities across Europe with remarkably, remarkably different and um, boundary conditions, different circumstances. So the, this, um, the definition should be very flexible in a way that it can actually take into account the different um, like conditions and the local diversity, and so that it, it keep, provide them um, like the very um, level playing field for the different cities. Although we can see that there are different challenges that we need to overcome in the um, development of the path definition, but what we have drawn also from the experience with working with the different um, cities and the different stakeholders involved in pets, we know that there are a set of key characteristics of pets that we should, um, that um, pets should actually um, achieve. And these include um, the positive impact. So when we talk about positive, we are not talking about just the energy balance and um, positive, but we want that pet to actually um, provide some positive impact to the wider energy system. So for example, we are seeing that the pet could be actively support the surrounding energy system by providing um, flexibility to the energy system. And also we have to, um, to know that pet is actually an area that have to be fundamentally energy efficient. So energy efficient in terms of the building, transportation, and in the infra and all other infrastructure system within the city that is all the district that is one very important um, aspect of that. And then comes after it is the um, maximizing the local renewable energy supplies. So pets should be um, entirely driven by or supplied by renewable energy, either locally or by the immediate surrounding. That is another important characteristic. And then the third one is to um, that pets should be integrated with the wider energy system because we do not want to create a um, positive energy island. We want to have positive energy districts that are connected properly and coordinate um, properly with the operation of the wider energy system in the city and the region. And finally, the pets also need to um, have and um, connect with the smart energy management 
so that the pet itself can provide the um, flexibility and have itself um, a very good um, energy balance within the district that it will not um, actually give any burden to the wider um, energy system. So now, after um, hearing a lot about pets, I think maybe some of you will be interested in knowing um, how you can get more information or how you can actually be more active and involved in the development of pets. And there are actually um, different opportunities out there. And I would like to hear just and um, point out one um, opportunities that you can actually um, get involved in this um, development of pets. The um, Positive Energy District European Network that I'm chair, and um, our objective is to try to mobilize the researchers and other um, relevant stakeholders across different sectors to drive the development of PET to support the, um, the creation of 100 positive energy districts in Europe. And we are doing this by sharing knowledge, exchange ideas, and try to um, pull resources together and also try to experiment um, new solutions together. And the network was um, funded by, is funded by the um, COST Association. We start um, in the, um, September 2020. And then the uh, action will run until um, September 2024, so it's four years. At the moment, it, we have already over 180 members in our network, representing over 40 countries and 130 organizations. If you can see the map on my right-hand side, you can see that um, we have um, the distribution of our members really um, in different parts of Europe and also cover some near neighbor countries, for example, and Turkey and Israel. But um, dear um, Vicky, I'm uh, yeah. sorry to jump in. Uh, we have gone over time. So oh, yeah, um, if, if you could uh, wrap up, uh, one, that would be yeah, fantastic. One, okay. yeah, Thank you fine. so much. Um, yeah, yeah, fine. And then um, in, within this um, Positive Energy District um, European Network, we have actually different working group working on different topics that you can see here. I'm not going into details, um, but we are working on, for example, mapping of the different characteristics of PEPs, mapping of the cases and database. We also have um, people working on the guides and tools for pets and also um, the pet map. And in this network, we organize different activities, conferences, meetings, um, research missions, um, also different um, kind of dissemination events. All the different events are targeted for different kind of stakeholders. For example, one of the very successful events we organized last year was a workshop done for, um, particularly for city stakeholders. And that was in Rome and we have um, over um, like 25 people actually um, travel to Rome and they are including um, city representatives to join us to share best, best practice and to um, discuss this topic together. And so if you're interested in our network to join us or to get to know more about the development impact, you can follow our website here. You can see the web address and also our Twitter. I think that's all. Yeah, if you have more information, you are welcome to contact me and you have my email address in the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Vicky. And I'm sorry to have you, having to rush you because uh, this is really interesting as well. And to see the the emerging concepts and and the the path that is uh, going to be taken over the next years. So this is really exciting, and also seeing what opportunities cities will have to to engage in the process and be supported in this process. So without further ado, I would love to um, now dive into the city level experiences and for that um, I am it is a real pr privilege to have uh, the city of Limerick represented here today uh, specifically uh, Rosie Webb who is the head of urban innovation at the city council uh, of Limerick um, Rosie fantastic to see you and we're really excited to to learn about your experiences uh, and some lessons learned from from your efforts to to um, you know uh, in a, develop a positive or move towards positive energy district performance. So. Thanks, Andreas, and it's great to be here. And thanks very much for the invitation. So uh, as Andrea said, my name is Rosie Webb and I'm the senior architect in Limerick City and County Council. Uh, I um, lead the 
a new section called urban innovation and I in that role I am the lighthouse city lead for uh, the EU city exchange project. I'm also now starting a new department, uh, a climate action part department in the city. So let me see if I can share my screen. So, and let me see if I can start the slide here. Okay. So yes, yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know Limerick, Limerick is a city of about 100,000 population and we're situated on the west coast of Ireland. And as I said, we're engaged in this EU project specifically looking at and addressing um, um, positive energy districts and positive energy blocks. Um, so let me see if I can get that to move. So just, just so I know, is the, is the screen, is the presentation moving? The presentation is moving. We do not see it in full screen, but we, we can see it. Okay. So, Let me see. Sorry. Okay. No I'm not quite sure how to change that, but I'll just keep going as I'm going, guys. We can see the slides. It's great. Okay. Thanks. So we're one of two lighthouse cities. Um, so ourselves and Trondheim in Norway, and we have a number of follower cities and we're leading the way with a number of demonstration projects and also um, uh, the replication of those projects in our follower cities. So in that project, we're working with public and private sector partners and like everything we do in the area of climate uh, change, uh, uh, we are working very closely with our partners and stakeholder engagement is, is really the key of that. Um, and in the in this role, we're we're leading, we're, we're providing leadership, but we're also engaging national programs at a local level, and we're responsible for developing our um, our local plans, and um, and reflecting our national targets. And in order to do that, we have to do, to engage with this wide uh, group of stakeholders. In the project itself, we have a number of uh, businesses working on monitoring and evaluation, providing digital platforms, providing uh, community grids. Uh, and also working with our, our uh, central ESB uh, electricity supplier. Um, the city change project is about creating positive energy blocks and districts um, in, in it's located in our city historic city center. So in terms of energy efficiency, um, we're trying to make improvements. We're aiming to achieve a, an energy savings of 2.1 gigawatt hours, but we're also trying to generate 1.25 gigawatt hours of renewable energy uh, in a distributed uh, fashion in the district. Uh, so we're doing things like looking at provision of PV uh, rooftop solar. Uh, we're trying to put in an innovative river turbine and uh, we're looking at trying to provide uh, PV arrays on some of our own local authority lands. Uh, the result we hope will be a reduction in CO2 of 750 tons per annum. And this is part of an overall strategy, which is uh, part of uh, our CCAP, uh, which we developed uh, as part of our submission uh, to joining the Covenant of Mayors in 2016. Uh, and our plans look at Limerick City's response to national targets on energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy and decarbonization, but also our own city's uh, aspirations for a just transition to a low carbon uh, uh, economy and our own local development plans, which are starting to incorporate a bold city vision that we're developing through the project. So just in terms of the CCAP, the CCAP sits into the framework of our varying obligations that we have to address. Uh, roughly the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Act, which has established a range of things. Uh, so we have set up these climate action regional offices in Ireland. And uh, we have, each local authority has had to produce climate action adaptation plans. And those will be followed by climate action mitigation plans um, and a national action plan uh, for the entire uh, country. So we will have carbon targets and target budgets that inform us of the things that we're obliged to do. And we have statutory obligations that we'll need to meet within that. And so these, uh, these frameworks inform our local development plan, which is in itself uh, informed by our CCAP. So this really forms the strategy for setting our own goals in relation to our development plan, uh, which reflects the national carbon neutral transition uh, targets. And as a part of that, we have each local authority has, to, has had to identify a decarbonization uh, zone. And we uh, this year will be uh, setting out implementation plans for those decarbonization zones. Um, our, our own bold city vision, which we've now incorporated into our development plan sets targets for energy and emissions balance. 
So in terms of our own energy and emissions balance, in 2005, Limerick was, was the first local authority to publish an energy and emissions balance in Ireland. And our most recent analysis, which was updated in 2020, shows that the, uh, shows the amount of energy uh, consumption and emissions that you produce. And you can see there clearly, as I think is common in most places, residential and transport make up the major uh, contributions of emissions and energy consumption. So this is uh, difficult for us to address as a local authority because this is really things that co consumers themselves spend. It's not really in our control. And uh, I suppose it's also worth saying that the standards of efficiency in the residential sector are not quite as good as they would be in the commercial industrial sectors where the profit margins are really driving those people to, to uh, address energy inefficiencies. Um, so we're also really not the drivers for uh, transport and we find that there's uh, great inefficiencies in this. There's a lot of work for us to do in this area. Um, just to put you in context, in Ireland, our targets, uh, we have had uh, very ambitious targets and unfortunately, and I suppose and very slimly have not have, have failed to meet those. Um, this is a problem for us at a local authority level as well because the levers for change in Ireland are held at central government level. I, it may be different in other places in Europe, but local authorities have very little autonomy in these issues. So our ability to affect change is largely in the hands of these state companies and large energy companies. Uh, we don't have much control over either of those. So uh, we facilitate progress by doing things like identifying projects that can take place and facilitating those through the planning process. Uh, but heretofore we have had little ability uh, or involvement in, in the infrastructural end of, of energy. Um, so this was why, this was one of our reasons uh, for, for uh, wanting to get involved in the city exchange project. Um, and the city exchange project addresses a sort of bottom up solution to energy generation. I think this is something that's common with, with DPEBs um, and looking at also looking at energy efficiency in itself and then looking at decarbonization through renewables uh, and then beginning to look at things like um, energy distribution and flexibility trading. Uh, the projects allows us um, access into an area that we would not normally be involved in. Um, and, and to be quite honest with you, we wouldn't really have the in-house expertise generally to do that or couldn't support it with things like uh, caps in, uh, in, num in, in people, but also uh, spending. So it's been a real learning curve for us to understand our local energy uh, usage and to have a greater access uh, to progress in this area. Um, as a local authority, we are accredited to the ISO 50001 standard, and we have actually exceeded our energy targets that were set by local government, which are 32%. Um, and, but, but really what we're focusing on now is bringing that track record, track record into the next phase, which is actually around helping others, helping citizens and stakeholders to affect change themselves. So the focus in the future is really on carbon. Um, so we have exceeded the target set for us for energy and emissions uh, already. The 2030 target is, is now to look at carbon and carbon reduction. And the challenge is significant. We have to have a 51% reduction in CO2 by 2030. For us in Limerick, that essentially represents a displacement of 500,000 tons of CO2. So this is significant and we will be addressing this by energy efficiency and renewables uh, and we'll be measuring that output by CO2 reduction. Uh, that's the metric I suppose that we're most interested in. So Limerick is making progress on addressing these targets. So the local authority itself have been implementing significant projects. We're embarking this year on our climate change mitigation plan which is a cross sectoral plan. Um, we have also moved all of our public lighting to LEDs and we're transitioning our fleet of cars to electric. We have been installing EV charges, chargers in, uh, in our functional areas and establishing a decarbonization zone and implementation plan this year. The city exchange project has allowed us to look at this whole concept of positive energy blocks and hopefully progressing back to a positive energy district. Uh, we have a river turbine demonstrator, which is now in planning permission. We have been able to establish a citizen innovation lab, which is really around setting up smart community uh, cooperation models, uh, you know, as I said, working with our, our various communities and stakeholders. We have importantly had been able through this through that project to have a 38% reduction in vacancy 
in our historic city center, which is the demonstration site for the city exchange project. And that has really because we have been very proactive in doing this kind of sites activation and, and the project has allowed us to do that, working very closely with property owners and then just showing the kind of things that can be done. And we are uh, supporting climate um, energy enterprises and innovation, uh, particularly things like the river turbine. So our positive energy block is located in our historic Georgian uh, neighborhood. So in, in Limerick, we have a, uh, a, a Georgian um, center. It's a Georgian new town, and, uh, but it has been, had an awful lot of neglect, neglect and dereliction. So we chose that as our positive energy block so that we could try to have an uh, impact on that. Um, and we're working very closely with five uh, particular building owners. Uh, one of them is a building that we uh, own ourselves and have a development company associated with the council that has done that up to a, a lead gold standard. Two of them are Georgian buildings working with our local chamber of commerce and one of our local auctioneers. We have a 1930s post office building and then our youth services center, which is in an historic Georgian building, which has been upgraded and has modern additions to it. So each of those five building owners have completed a baseline energy modeling of the buildings. And then we are providing advice on operational improvements, on turbulent energy envelope improvements, on options for upgrading the building energy systems, on uh, optimization of their local energy network, and then the installation of, of uh, renewables. So there are very significant issues for achieving energy efficiency in the urban areas, particularly around the historic and conservation areas. And we also find this not just with historic conservation, but also with fire uh, issues. Um, it's interesting to note that in Limerick, in the city center area, our core city center, over 80% of our buildings are historic in nature. And so I think, you know, when we're talking about achieving these uh, savings by 2030, we're really looking at a problem of retrofit, something like, um, you know, over 60% of the buildings that, that will need to achieve that energy efficiency in Ireland are already existing. So this is really a problem of retrofitting. And in terms of traditional construction methodologies, uh, they have completely different technologies in that they require breathable insulation and they have a very close relationship uh, to heating and moisture. So the fabric of the building itself is, is very closely related to uh, you know, the moisture content. So we find that in past where we have upgraded them and haven't taken into account those specific requirements, it has created uh, mold and health issues in the building. So there has been a huge uh, learning curve, um, but again, it will also need to be followed up with the skills development. So what we're finding is that our, our local contractors maybe don't have those kind of skills and even our local uh, engineers and architects are, aren't really up to, up to scratch on, on, on the traditional buildings uh, construction in, ter in terms of how that needs to be energy uh, retrofitted. So this, we have been very active with the guidelines being upgraded for traditional um, energy efficiency in traditional buildings, but also producing brochures for people and, and trying to bring those out to our stakeholders. Um, and one of the greatest barriers to progress that we have found has been this lack of commitment to compact urban development. So historically, it's been easier to develop greenfield sites, and these are far preferred. And so we're, we're working really hard to reverse that way of thinking and the culture and preferences, and particularly the financial systems that have accompanied uh, that type of uh, development. So just to quickly go through where we're, we're, we're starting to support these innovative projects around local green energy production. Um, the installation of tidal turbines on the river is something that we're exploring through the city exchange project. So lots of European cities are located on rivers. Limerick itself is located on the largest river in Ireland, the River Shannon. There is already a large hydroelectric dam called Ardna Crusher that was built at the infancy of, of the state uh, in the 1930s. That is generating electricity from the river. And we're now working with uh, G Kinetic, one of our local um, businesses who have analyzed the potential to provide 180 kilowatts of local energy generation on the river. The project is being implemented in two phases with the first phase being 30 kilowatts of generation as a demonstration. And that prototype, through using that prototype, uh, we hope to develop the business case to deliver that, the, the other 150 and to, I suppose, more importantly, to uh, build up the renewable energy community that might own and, um, and operate that. Okay, and because, uh, because the change that we, we require to get to our goals is required at a quicker rate than we ever have needed it before, we know that the 
people will be the main drivers of this change. And so we have established this ecosystem of citizen innovation in Limerick. And this involves um, trying to um, encourage active citizenship in co-design process, working with ourselves, our local um, uh, third level academic institutions and entrepreneurs in order to devise and trial new urban products and services, and particularly focusing on these kind of social and cultural needs. Um, so we've developed a number of processes that enable us to do this, this kind of to bring top down and bottom up processes of engagement together. And we have these citizen participation playbooks, which we've managed to develop through the city exchange project. We're supporting a group of positive energy champions and a network around that. And we're providing opportunities for citizens themselves to trial and test their own solutions. Uh, so we have things as diverse as do it together air sensor, uh, quality sensors being produced, mapping of a cycle bus, the potential to form river energy communities, uh, and things like growing the trying to extend the growing uh, season for allotments. And then lastly, um, we are uh, supporting some of our local enterprise innovation for products like the river turbine. So I'll stop at that. I see uh, Andreas that I'm running over time. So look, we're I'm happy to answer any questions, or even if if people want to contact me, we can we can provide further information. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rosie. And uh, indeed, uh, please do ask us questions. Um, you also have my email address. So if you later on in the day um, have some ideas that, that you would like to get in touch with uh, one of our speakers, please do reach out to me and I will relay those questions to our speakers and get back to you. Um, very happy to do that. Uh, just a quick, quick response to Rosie's fantastic presentation. It's really inspiring to see um, the, the implementation of the project. I think it's also highly transferable in terms of the goal setting um, being kind of translated into local action. Uh, so this process is very relevant to our other cities. Um, also, the historical building context is our reality that many of our cities deal with um, and also the wind uh, the the river turbine is an exciting example so thanks for inspiring us rosie it, it, it was really great to to have this overarching presentation from you um, without further ado i would like to now introduce our second city level case study and here it is my great pleasure to introduce samuli rine who is a project manager for the eu funded making city project at the city of olu in Finland. And he has a background in energy technology and has been working in the field for many years, um, including on biomass combined heat and power plant projects. So, um, Samuli, the, the floor is yours and we're very excited to, to hear about your project experiences. Thank you, Andre. Uh, hello, everybody. Just um, sharing my screen. So, and then um, now I think you, you see the presentation. We do, yes. Thank yes. You. Okay. Uh, I'm telling about uh, mainly about technologies in our project, which is uh, also Horizon project, as, as heard in earlier examples. And uh, well, this goes around PET and energy efficiency, of course. So, let's see. Our targets, um, they are like the following. Well, you heard uh, we can present the PET idea and perhaps not more about that than uh, our model is um, for the reasons you may see, <coughs> they, are, they are that uh, we must take into account the regional aspect, especially even if we try to get the energy efficiency locally, of course. And uh, for that, real data and models are used to assess how we are doing. And um, targets in the city, they are carbon dioxide neutrality, of course, so that the emissions, they, they are not transferred to some other places. So there's a balance in, in, in the region of the energy production. And we, we use renewable energy as much as possible, and it, it must be practically 100%. And the social sustainability was also mentioned earlier. So, so the, for example, people who don't have that much money, they are not in problems. 
and uh, that's related to the cost of energy, of course. In Finland, there's not this far uh, mentionable amounts of uh, energy poverty, but uh, for example, the electricity price has come up now significantly, so we must be careful with that. And the other targets in our project, we make a city vision for energy issues till 2050 or 2030-40 in more realistic terms. Nobody knows 2050. Uh, then try to give some recommendations for policies, policy makers, and go, uh, have uh, negotiations with those. And uh, try to do that kind of um, um, solutions that are replicable in other cities, of course, because um, in EU project we have follower cities, six follower cities, we and Groningen in, in the Netherlands and light, Lighthouse cities. And of course, um, we think about the replicability, replicability in general also. And one more issue is, is that we try to provide or prove the low one of risk for investors, so, so the investments needed are done. And uh, what we must do is, is to show that the technical technologies are feasible. And here you can see our partners here in all there are university and VTT and companies and city and so on. Also the local big energy company. Okay, and then then some background issues. Um, as we are in quite north, we have some, uh, say, challenges with solar energy. This, this uh, represents some uh, monthly productions and consumptions uh, in one year. So here the upper curve, it's electricity consumption. And it's quite self-clear that in the winter time it's larger because of the electrical heating, which is quite a high amount in Finland. Uh, then wind energy production, well, it depends year by year, but it mainly, luckily, it's a bit more, uh, there's a bit more production in winter time than in summertime, which is of course nice. And uh, this is for photovoltaic solar, solar power, and it's quite self-clear that in, in summertime it's, it peaks, and in winter time it's near, nearly zero, which uh, of course it, it's a challenge in bad sense. And how to solve that? Well, here you can see current and future electricity production in our region always here, and this is 90 kilometers, this region distance. And as you, as you take a look at the numbers, um, the wind power, it's, it's a very, very, very big issue here. This is one of the best wind areas in Finland, and it's visible in these numbers. There's a huge amount of wind power perhaps coming. The electricity consumption of this area without large scale industries, it's about one point, uh, sorry, two terawatt hours about that. So you can compare this with these numbers. And uh, combined heat and power production we have, this does not include uh, industries yet still. It's only with that with uh, district heating production. Uh, 600 gigawatt hours, and then we have hydropower, about one terawatt hour in this area. And uh, compared to this, uh, PV production is quite low, but even if it's low, it may be very feasible still. And of course, it, it, it should be built as much as possible because it's, uh, let's say, it's neat energy, looks good and so on. Doesn't cause any sound and so on. And in the future, again, we are in the background of the core issue. Uh, in the future, if we take a look at the future heat production in Oulu, then we can estimate that about half of that comes from compound heat and power plants, which are biopowered more and more. Peat was used earlier a lot, but now we are going more and more towards wood. It's about 50-50 nowadays. This is uh, a new compound heat and power plant in Oulu. And uh, <clears throat> from industry, wood industry, about 15% will come, and already now that's the case. And uh, one can say that wind energy runs heat pumps, which cover the rest. This is one scenario, but I think it's, it's uh, very probable in the future. And so with this, we can get zero emissions. And uh, it may go like this. 
and the target of the city is to have carbon neutral in 2035. So this may be the carbon emission from distilled heat production. I think so. And then to our project, especially, um, this is not exact picture from reality, but in, it shows the principle. So we are district heating network between buildings existing. And one component in the system is grocery store, uh, which feeds excess heat from refrigeration to district heating network to be used elsewhere. This works well, it's, it's in place. And we have also borehole storage, which uh, makes possible in summertime to store energy there and take out in wintertime. And uh, <clears throat> then one specialty in buildings, we have uh, district heating return water heat pumps in separate buildings. Uh, they, they make it possible to extract heat from the return water. And uh, we get more from flue gas scrubbers in the power plants. So that's a system level operation. And of course we have say more commonplace solution is, is that we have uh, exhaust air heat pumps in old buildings. And also, we, also a bit exotic is that we have a wastewater heat recovery in the buildings. So, and uh, all of these work quite well. So no major problems with this. So they are replicable in that sense. Okay, and here are <coughs> cavalcade of pictures of, about the buildings. Here you can see our reno to be renovated building. And it's uh, actually, yeah, it's already renovated. Built in 70s, there are quite many like this in Finland. That's a big issue. So, and in these buildings, it was our uh, exhaust air heat pump installed, as you can see here. That's the equipment on the container waiting for the installation. And here you can see wastewater um, heat extraction uh, or heat, heat recovery system. It's very simple, simple passive component. So, no heat pump here, just exchange. And with this, we can actually update this in Finnish conditions, old building, so-called old building, to it what the same than the new ones. So this is effective. And here on the construction in our project, there's a new block of flats building, very efficient um, isolation, 20 centimeters of polyurethane in, in the walls and so on. So the <clears throat> heat loss is very, very low. And here, here text about, about the solutions. So there are heat recoveries from say all waste streams and the building envelope, it's very effective. And um, well, for example, the windows, they are so good that they, if there were, if they were just uh, glasses without coatings and gases in between, they should, they could, it's similar than there would be nine glasses. So that's the insulation level. And then one specialty, there's a preheating of uh, incoming air on the building. There's a pipeline which heats up the outside air. And well, of course, photovoltaic on the roof, that's a quite common place. So nothing special. And then I mentioned we have that grocer store which feeds uh, heat to the district heating network. Here you can see the energy flows from that. Um, I think I think this presentation will be there online, so you can take a more closer look afterwards if you want, and you, you can also ask me but later. But the important issue is that it feeds quite a lot to this heating network, and uh, it's working better and better when we have adjusted the system. So that's working well, and it's it's uh, also remarkable that this will be in uh, this will be a common common solution in all the new shops in Finland. And then one more building in our project is a school building that's very big. And uh, one practice, and there we also are going to install a heat pump from district um, heating return water. And um, one practical issue in this kind of is that when you do something to old buildings, it may be uh, well quite a messy thing. So there may be some challenges, as you see, this is from the technical 
technical room of the building. So there's quite a lot of lot to do in this kind of installation and very practical tailor, tailoring that must be remembered always. And one more issue, not directly related, but must be mentioned, Oulu is a winter cycling city, so it looks like, it looks like this for now. And this is very nice, in my opinion. Which, uh, of course, this is also part of the energy efficiency. Well, and then finally, we made a survey about the energy and environment attitudes of, of people in Oulu. And uh, the results, in a nutshell, they were that uh, the relative importance of issues was, was that the price was the most important one. Well, say it, it has a comparison number two, and then uh, security of supply and environmental issues, they were about half of that in importance. But it's, it's even if it's like this, I think it's very good that environmental issues, they are that high. However, price is not everything. And most of people, nearly all, they are interested how big are the environmental impact. And uh, what is asked for is openness in, a, in every level. So we must tell what we are doing and what energy companies are doing and so on. And what we have learned about this all, well, these technical solutions I presented, they work well when they are adjusted properly. This may take some time and must be remembered, not, not a turnkey operation in practice, and they must be tailored in places in, in all buildings. So some extra cost for that must be there. And then long side, long side is it's essential that's self clear, but it must be remembered. So you must not wait short payback times and so on. This is this is, um, this is working for the future. This whole thing. And uh, about um, how to take the inhabitants into account, everyday actions and and their VCs, they must really be heard and uh, practice is done after that. So, so you must not uh, be, um, you must not think that you know everything and they don't know that, that that's a bad mistake, especially in Finland. So some kind of equal equality, it's important. And then about the prices and so on. If you can say that the price is quite the same than it has been about energy, when we're talking about energy, it works well. And you tell openly about this, then people accept what you are doing. This is the, perhaps the most important lesson we have learned. So that was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we have quite a few technical people as well in the audience. And I'm sure that this was a very exciting presentation for, for them. Um, but also just seeing the, the transferability potential of, of some of these, these um, in solutions in, in the northern climate, but with some tailoring perhaps also elsewhere. Um, this is really great and uh, great to see. And also looking at the, the CCAPs, um, the local actions that are proposed by cities, we see a lot of school building projects, um, a lot of renovation uh, being planned there. So this is really very valuable information. So thank you so much for sharing. And uh, I, we, in the interest of time, we need to move on. Um, we have been giving a lot of space to these presentations and I think it was important to do so. Um, so I think uh, our, our panel discussion discussion will will more or less be transformed into a question and answer round. Um, so we will be quite short and snappy with these. And uh, with that, I would like to invite all of all of the speakers to switch on their cameras. And we will go for a quick fire round of questions and answers. Um, I think, uh, firstly, we, we touched upon the, the boundaries of positive energy districts already. So I will, I will skip um, this section and, and just um, dive perhaps a little deeper on the stakeholder engagement aspect, which has been coming out as being quite important, well, very important in, in, in order to, to realize these sustainability transformations at, at the neighborhood level. So with that, I wanted to ask Rosie whether, 
whether like uh, how important this has been in the case of the city of Limerick and whether you can identify certain certain challenges for for the city council in actually uh, carrying this engagement work out. Oh yeah, I mean I, I have to say uh, Andreas, it's 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 very important for Limerick. Limerick Limerick is a city that has historically has a very low employment rates, and we have uh, lots of issues with, you know, you know, fuel poverty and just general poverty. So it's really important to us that we take the opportunity of climate action to, you know, to to kind of create some systemic innovation to tackle some of these issues like inequality and create new jobs for people. So that's really at the top of our agenda. So I suppose really you know, that really requires us to have this kind of whole system approach, you know, uh, I think one of the, the things that we're worried about with the transition is that, you know, if it's really just down to property owners getting a lot of money to do up their buildings, and in Limerick, what we're finding is a lot of, of the property owners aren't actually, uh, th there's a lot of vacancy, so they might only use the ground and, and uh, basement floor, and the upper floors they don't want to use, there's fire issues, they don't want to solve that, it's too difficult. So they're quite happy to do up their buildings, but then not rent them out. And we have all kinds of issues with affordable housing. So we really have to take a whole system approach. And I think, you know, you have to bring people along. So we're trying to, one of the reasons we're setting up this citizen innovation system is just exactly um, what uh, Samuli said that, you know, you have to listen to people. They know, and there's a danger if you try to push too fast, that there's just gonna be a backlash that you might have unintended consequences and then you actually go backward rather than forward. So we really have to bring people along with us when we do it. Um, you know, it, it's also requiring a lot of time from people. You know, so you're asking people to come out in the evenings usually because they have day jobs. So I do think there's a role to, you know, to, to, to actually pay people to do this sort of thing at a kind of citizen level, um, you know, to, to kind of uh, create like longer lasting networks. We've also tried to do things like where we have citizen engagement, put them on digital platforms, um, we've, you know, COVID has come in the middle of our EU project that has been a blessing and a curse. It's allowed us to reach a lot more people, um, you know, who, who don't actually have to come out in the evening and also trying to keep a repository of that information in some way that people can access so they can see what other people are thinking. Uh, it's really important to do that work to build trust among all of our, our, our you know, community. And then I suppose also this thing of trying to make all the global challenges local. You know, what we find when we do surveys is people really want to make a change, but they really just don't know what to do or where to start. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing those insights. And I would just like to quickly bounce over to Samuli, um, whether to what, to what extent this is a reality, um, whether you're experiencing similar a similar situation or whether the, the well, the, the issues you encounter are somewhat different. Yeah, yeah, it's easy to <coughs> write down what uh, uh, Rosie said. So, so um, there's a risk of uh, bouncing back if, if you, um, well, if you, uh, if you look like you know too much, if you know uh, <laughs> kind of more than people. So, so you must not say that you should do this and that, but you must ask, uh, what do you think if, if we do this and that? So, so that's the proper way of going forward. I just noticed that I was muted um, on, on stakeholder engagement. I think that there's a, it is a, a deep uh, subject where one can uh, talk a lot, but I, for, in the interest of time, I think it's good if we just quickly address um, some technical um, challenges. And, and there, I would like to ask Andreas, um, like from building on the experience from the Access Project, uh, what you've already mentioned some in the in the presentation you gave, but can you expand a little on on the technical challenges you have faced? And this can be at the building level, but also yeah. um, moving towards the the district level. Adding to what what I mentioned in my presentation, the EU regulation wants to make buildings flexible, wants buildings to interact act uh, among each other and with the grids. We need new technologies, but we also need local companies that are able to implement this. And there's a big gap of knowledge, know-how, and skills. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I, 
I, I, I, in the interest of time, I will just uh, not not reflect, but move straight to Ro Rosie to to also ask her um, about the the issues you've encountered uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency measure implementation or renewable energy generation. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I actually think the technology is there. It's 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 implementing it right. So it's the same thing of you know, do the people who are on the coal face who are giving advice know the proper advice? Are there people are the skills there to do that? I'm thinking about retrofitting work. I'm also thinking from a technical challenge of financial systems. Like we certainly need to change some of our financial systems so that outcomes bring in, you know, the return on, in, on investment on these type of things, particularly things like retrofitting. A, they're very long, but also what's not taken into account is the, let's just say, societal impacts. So you don't get any benefit for, you know, contributing toward cleaner air or you know uh you know carbon reductions and, and that needs to be in some way monetized and brought into business case thinking and i think also in terms of uh investment packages and how those monies get made available to people and on what terms yeah i i believe the the access project has um also been working in this direction in in terms of the business models and uh, trying to have packaged solutions that that address yeah. The, the demand side. Um, Andreas, would you like to extra add to that or? I would say regarding business models, we are a bit at the starting point only. This will be uh, worked on within the next two years. Okay, so watch this space and uh, we will be back with some fantastic business models to really drive the, drive the transition. So um, it's definitely something to look forward to. So thank you for that. Um, I would like to just quickly touch upon the, the local, regional, and national policy frameworks. And, and here again, um, just jumping to, to Rosie, um, you, your presentation did feature the, the kind of framing uh, and the, the national acts and le legislative environment. Um, with, what, with what kind of different levels of governments did you have to collaborate to realize this project, to drive things forward? Um, can you name a few of the key players? Yeah, I mean, we are definitely working, you know, the department sets all our goals in terms of climate change. Um, at, like, so there's the Department of Climate uh, and Communications, but also we're working with the Department of Environment, local government, housing. And that's important because, uh, you know, there are very ambitious targets set, but in order to actually achieve them, it needs to follow through, I think, again, from a systemic way. So local authorities need to be enabled to do that work. And I think we can't also lose sight of things like affor affordability of housing as, as, we're, as we're increasing you know, our energy things. I think the other challenge that we face is that there's, a, let's say an overall national planning framework. So at the same time that we're trying to decarbonize, we're having to increase our population by half by 2040. So you know, there, it's, these things are interrelated to each other and we all need to be talking to each other. So I think these cross sectoral and cross governmental uh, frameworks that allow us to do that are important. Like I think the CCAP was also very important for that. So even though that's not a legislative thing, that was something we volunteered. It's as you say, under as the coalition of the willing, that has been very helpful in helping us to set targets and understand them even before the legislation has come in place. Yeah, I, I, we we also see the the value of of the CCAPs uh, on a daily basis in our work, and it's it's great to have a. Uh, a uniform approach and and it's also provides quite a quite a robust guideline and and the the monitoring framework to back it up so um great to great to plug plug the c caps at this juncture um so thank you for that um great um i think uh, maybe we could have one more reflection um from Samui on this point uh whether the other levels of government have have been um, engaged or needed to be engaged or what are there areas for instance where you do not have as a city the the leverage to to enact changes to transform your districts uh, well i think in, in finland the political situation is uh, in that sense quite good because, for example, the current government, it's, it's in very favor of uh, these, these issues. And of course, there are political debates 
all politicians are not in line with, with this. So the main concern is, is that energy gets more pricey. And, uh, but otherwise, there are no, no significant regulatory barriers, if I am asked. So the main, main uh, pain points may be technical, techno-economical. So, so simply, we don't, um, the equipment, it's not cheap enough or working well, not well enough. And mostly, I can, uh, it can be said that uh, these uh, technical problems, they can, be, they can be overcome. But the economic point, it's, it's more, more uh, serious. Uh, well, Finland, it, it's a country of engineers. So that's one, <laughs> one that must be remembered. And uh, these, uh, say, political barriers, they can be overcome quite easily in many cases, if, if you have a good rational to do that. So... It's very encouraging to hear that uh, the, the system is uh, working so well in Finland and uh, certainly deserves a closer look from, from other European countries as well. Um, we've talked about these institutional arrangements and, and government uh, interactions, and, and I would like to give a final word to, to Vicky to kind of reflect on, on, this, um, on these dynamics and where, where do positive energy districts fit and where should they be integrated um, if you could give us a, a, a some again back to the frameworks uh, your share your wisdom with us yeah so um, we talk a lot about positive energy districts it has been a um, very important um, concept in the last few years but I think we shouldn't forget that um, positive energy districts is not the ultimate goal. And so we have to remember that and um, what we want to achieve or what we want to achieve in the end of the day is um, climate neutrality by 2050. And so that's why we have to link um, obviously the local planning um, with our the national um, planning. So um, as I understood that um, at the local level, it is relatively difficult um, to do with changing regulation and, and so on. So the, the local government do need a lot of support from the national um, and regional um, level um, government in order to provide the um, really um, uh, 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 con conducive legal and political environment for them so that they can actually do their work. And so they have to really communicate and understand the local legal circumstances in order to provide the right environment to facilitate and to drive this development. I think that is the most important thing. That is a very clear message and I think a very fitting message to wrap up today's session. Um, thank you very much, Vicky, for, the, for your insights and also to, to all our speakers and panelists today, um, a heartfelt thank you uh, for sharing these really inspirational cases and also your expertise with us today. I think it will be really valuable for our audience, um, for the city representatives um, that are um, trying to figure out their pathway towards decarbonizing their neighborhoods and, and cities and becoming more energy efficient. So this is really um, a great starting point. I do believe that the discussion will continue on this. We are seeing that the things are developing. Um, it'll be a really, really exciting couple of years to come. And we look forward to having more of these interactions with you um, to, to de develop our thoughts further and to track the progress and see where we stand in, in a year, in two years time. Uh, that would be fantastic. So um, thank you all. Um, thank you to our wonderful audience. And uh, yes, if you have any questions, please reach out to myself or the speakers individually, and we will get back to you. So have a wonderful day and uh, take care. Thanks, Andreas. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.